Hello, everyone. So um, welcome to our webinar. I'm very excited today because we've got Kurt Egerman with us today to talk about direct instruction and um, talk more in depth about his work. And he's already recently published a book, uh, which I will invite you to uh, have a look. Uh, but he's, he will talk more about it um, with us today. Um, so Kurt is the director of the National Institute for Direct Instruction. Um, and the president as well. And so I'm going to let him introduce himself in you know more detail to you. Thank you, Jessica. It's really nice to be here um, to talk with you about direct instruction, one of my favorite topics. <clears throat> so I've been involved in direct instruction ever since I was a teenager. My father, who was the co-creator of direct instruction and the senior author of all the DI programs, except spelling mastery, there's a story there. Uh, he was actually the, the co-author, and Bob Dixon was the, the primary author of that one. Anyway, since I was a teenager, I was recruited summers to help write items for the D different DI programs, not really involved in, in um, design at the time, but writing different items, stories, et cetera, for, for reading mastery, corrective, uh, corrective reading, expressive writing. And I worked uh, quite a bit with Bob Dixon and Mary Meyer, now Mary Meyer Bauer, on spelling mastery when I was 19. Um, in my early 20s, I was involved in behavior management. My father had a behavior management um, regime that he was working on. I worked with him and Jeff Colvin, went and did something completely different for 15 years came back in 2000. I've been with NIFTI ever since, the National Institute for Direct Instruction, which was founded by my father in 1997 to help schools and districts implement direct instruction with an emphasis on using DI for core instruction across all the major subject areas. Great, you've got so much background and yes, I, I didn't mention you that, but obviously, you know, you carry on the legacy um, of his work, which is fantastic. Um, could you um, maybe start by sharing one interesting fact about direct instruction? Can I share two, please? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, good. One of them um, is that this book back here, not this one, but this book here, All Students Can Succeed, is a meta-analysis that came out a few years ago uh, authored by Dr. Gene Stockard and others. And it represents the largest meta-analysis on any instructional approach in the history of education. They looked at uh, over 500 studies and the, the results of the meta-analysis, as was the case with the five other meta-analysis that have been done over the years, is that direct instruction is highly effective. So that's fact number one. one. <laughs> fact, fact number two is uh, that, as many of you listening may know, there's a difference between uppercase direct instruction that have to use with the implementation, has to do with the implementation of the published DI programs, and lowercase direct instruction, also called explicit instruction, that uses many of the same teaching methods, essentially the same teaching methods, uh, as much as possible without the, the curriculum. And uh, it was actually back in 1966 when my father and his colleague, uh, Carl Breiter at the University of Illinois, first used the term direct instruction lowercase. Um, so he's the originator of the term small direct instruction. And that was 20 years before Rosenshine came out with his 1986 list. Uh, and, and he transitioned quickly to capital DI in the late 1960s, early 70s, when the DI programs were published. Thanks for clarifying this, because I find when I go to schools, um, they often talk about direct instruction, not knowing the distinction between lowercase and uppercase. And then there has been lots of confusing terminology like EDI for explicit direct instruction and then EI explicit instruction. So it's always good to be reminded of, of the distinction of, of these terminologies. Um, I'm gonna go into the a deep dive into the, the features of DI programs. And um 
there are two key features that um, I guess here I'd like to point out. One is the incremental step design. And the second one is the faultless communication. So mostly carried by, by having a scripted program. Could you define those two for me and, and expand a little bit on it? Yes, absolutely. Those are two of the most important um, qualities or features of the DI program. So it's great that you identified them. The incremental step design is something that is unique to the DI programs. And it's unique, even though it's highly, highly successful if it's implemented with fidelity, it's unique because it's very difficult to do. So incremental step design means that you teach in small increments and or small steps. You can think of it as a staircase. And in the DI programs, only 10 to 15% of any lesson is new. Some of these new things may seem very, very simple, but they're very important in instruction. For instance, early on when students are just about to start, start to read connected text, they have, there's an exercise where they touch the first word, then the next word, then the next word. So they just are touching words. And then when they're reading stories, that really facilitates it because otherwise the teacher will have to monitor and prompt much more for kids who haven't mastered to us, which, which is a really, really simple skill. Uh, another example that I have in, in, in my book uh, has to do with where students who are doing column addition, where they carry the tens. Mm -hmm. And in the corrective mathematics addition, there is, are exercises that go for a few days that give the students the answer and just give them practice in writing the correct number in the one spot and the correct number in the 10 spot, numeral, I should say, in the 10 spot. And after they do that for a few days, they've got it. And that is that just eliminates that possible misstep by students. So that gives you an idea of the small step design, but only 10 to 15% is new. And that has a couple of very important implications. One is that if students were at mastery at the previous day's lesson, that means that there's only a little bit more they need to learn in order to master today's lesson, which will set the stage for success tomorrow, the next mm -hmm. day, the next day. So as long as kids are placed appropriately in the, in the programs and taught to mastery, they can, they can go through the program and learn all the content. And then the remaining 85 to 90% of the material is all review or applications of skills and concepts that have been introduced previously. And so what does that do? That develops automaticity. Uh, as they say in cognitive science, it's moving it into long-term memory. This was designed way before those, those, those terms cognitive load were used. But, so incremental step design is absolutely critical. Then the other feature you talked about was faultless communication. And faultless communication is a very complex way of making sure that there is a single interpretation by the, by, by the learner of the different examples you present. So is the setup, is the wording, and are the examples such that the student, if the student already has the prerequisite skills, will that student come out with, uh, will they master the content that you want? And so that's what, what um, uh, the faultless communication does. And this book here, The Theory of Instruction, a very light read, I'm being sarcastic. Uh, yeah. It has all of the rules with plenty of examples of how to, can, how to teach different types of skills and content through faultless communication. Great, I've got that book, it's a red one. I know that I, um, I started reading it when I got my first job in teaching, uh, working in remedial setting for high school kids. Um, so, okay, so about faultless communication, I guess that's part of, you know, the, the thoughtful script that um, teachers use when they deliver DI programs. So I'm just wondering whether you could expand on um, how do you choose a good example, non-example, because throughout the scripts, 
to prevent any misconception from happening, um, they are and to refine, I guess, the concept that you're teaching, you use example and non-example. Um, so how how do we let's say I'm a teacher, I want I want to try, I know it's hard, I won't put together a DI script, but help teachers understand how we can choose effectively example and non-examples. It, it, it is good for teachers who are using DI to understand these design elements, mm -hmm. but also teachers will always be teaching things that are outside of the program, whether it has to do with local history, culture, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a couple, I won't go through all the content there, but there are a couple of, of uh, rules to follow. The first is to show the maximum range of whatever concept or skill that you, you are focusing on. So let's say a child doesn't understand blue, isn't sure what blue is. And so we're gonna teach the color blue to the child. Well, then we would wanna make sure to show a wide range of things that are blue. Uh, we could have clothes that are blue, a car that is blue, a pen or other writing utensils that are blue, pictures of, of fish that are blue, et cetera. So we just show a wide range so they understand that they won't get a misinterpretation that blue has to do with a certain type of thing like, like clothes. If you're just to show clothes, they may think, well, blue has to do with clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so having a wide range and then showing minimal differences uh, among that, that set of items that you presented. So for instance, with a pen, you would show a blue pen, but then you would and say that this is blue, and then you would show another colored pen, red or what have you, and say, this is not blue. And so if those things are identical, and you do that for a few of the items, then they will immediately generalize and understand what what blue is and what's what's really interesting is that if you structure the examples correctly you don't have to have a super amount you can do it in in a fairly short number of of items that's great and i like you mentioned about the gen generalization of rules so um because over time you want the kids to be able to apply that concept or skills in a in another context, right? When they come to encounter that. Absolutely. And that that gets back to model, lead, and test, which in mm -hmm. small TI is I do, we do, you do. But yes, you have your initial presentation, which you're modeling the the examples, and then immediately, immediately you do test examples to to make sure that the students have that. And then do that for a few lessons to make sure that it, it starts moving into long-term memory. Yeah, that it's firmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you did touch uh, briefly on, um, you know, the importance of, of a high rate of success. Um, you know, you talked about that consolidation of the script or having or in each lesson, you've got 10, 15% new and 80, 85. Why is that so important for the kids to hit mastery? Oh, well, first of all, Again, it really does depend on where that the student is placed at their skill level. Yeah. Then uh, it does it does depend on whether there that all the errors are corrected and the students have sufficient practice. But if that's done correctly, it has a tremendous, tremendously positive effect on student self image, because. If they come to school each day knowing there's just 10 to 15% new, and I might have to work at it a bit, but I will master this, then their self-image increases, their attitude towards school increases, the, the uh, ability for them to develop grit uh, mm. and, and work through difficult times increases greatly because they have that success every single day. Yeah, that's great. And, and motivation, yeah, greed and motivation, clearly. They'd be more likely to tackle a new task or have a go at it. Yeah. Um, about the script, um, how does it work? Do you guys, like, how do you field test the script, you know, when you put together a program? I know it might not be in your specific area, um, but you would know about how this is working. Could you tell us more about that? 
Right. I haven't personally been involved, but for years I've, I've been on the side with regard to the scripts. And this is another feature. You're hitting all the, or, or some of the, the biggest features about direct instruction. Something that should be standard across education is to mm -hmm. field test mm -hmm. the curriculum when it's properly implemented and then revise it as needed until it's shown to be successful, which that's what's happened with the DI programs. So what happens is uh, it's a similar process whenever there is uh, a new program or if there are revisions um, that school partner schools are identified classrooms where there's students who meet the, the entrance requirements for the program. Mm -hmm. And the scripts are, are then delivered to the teachers and they're monitored very closely in a few different or for a few different things. One is whether the scripts are being implemented with fidelity, because if they're not being implemented with fidelity, then it's not a legitimate test of, of the efficacy of the lesson. Uh, and then it's how the students perform. So what happens is quite often with an audio tape, there has been videotape in the past, but just having an audio recorder where the whole session is recorded from beginning to end mm -hmm. uh, gives a really good idea of what's happening during group instruction and then the collection of any other written work. So independent work, which as you know, is tied to the current lesson and past lessons, and then any sort of in-program assessments, the checkouts or the mastery tests, those mm -hmm. results are sent back. So. And then when there is a problem, because you're doing this, it's not perfect the first time, uh, quite often there'll be some mistakes, then the authors will write remedies and what they like to do. And this whole process is coordinated uh, between the authors and the Engelman Becker Corporation. Engel, my father and Wesley Becker, the other creator of Direct Instruction, founded that company back in the early 1970s. Um, so what happens is they will rewrite a new script, try it out with those kids who had, had the problem and maybe refine it again. And hopefully they'll have another classroom, maybe in the same school, maybe in a different school where they're coming up on that lesson and they can try that out again. So it's not just a one and done. They will try out the remedies to make sure that they work. Yeah, yeah, it takes a lot of work. <laughs> like it's when you said lot. that each session is recorded, we're talking like a good 50 minutes to release really into it yeah. and taking notes on on what the teacher says, what the student says, and and how to apply the remedies, right? Yeah. Right. No, it it gives a new meaning to high quality instructional materials. Uh, yeah, it brings a lot of rigor. Yeah. It does, yes. Um that it's a nice segue, actually. You're talking about remedies uh, for those kids who might not hit that mastery at that point in time. In that case, we're talking about um, field testing the script. But in uh, once the program is out, like um, how do we, or what would you say, because that's what I face when I talk to schools sometimes, implementing DI or being on the, on the, you know, on the cusp of maybe implementing DI. Some of the questions are around differentiation, which is a bit of a big, buzzword in education um how you know what would you reply to someone who says well di doesn't allow for differentiation i would say for the most part it's true that di does not incorporate differentiated instruction in terms of different processes or product etc but instruction is differentiated within the di programs for different students through placement and grouping extra practice. Uh, so if you can think of the, the program as consisting of, of a bunch of pre-skills. So mm -hmm. one of the things that my father and company did was to analyze what are all the pre-skills that kids need to know before they can do other skills. So he was a pioneer, for instance, in oral blending before you can read or segmenting before you can spell, those type of things. So the DI programs 
consist of the, the sequence of different skills that kids are learning and getting more and more sophisticated as time goes on. So in the DI approach, in order for kids to succeed, you need to fi find out what are the pre-skills they need to work on, bring them to mastery so that they can go on. And the mechanism for doing that is placing them in the programs, grouping them with others who are at their, their particular skill level right now, but having flexible groups so that some kids can go up. So uh, just a, a quick anecdote is uh, when we were working with one middle school, we were working with several middle schools uh, in, in uh, Atlanta, and we started the school year. All the students were at least two years below grade level. Nobody was at, at grade level. They were all on corrective reading. And there were two sixth graders who placed into decoding A, which as you know, is pre-primer starts yes. out. Yes. Those students, those students simply, you could use the term undertaught. No one had ever explained to them explicitly how letters make sounds and how you blend those together to make words, et cetera. And by the end of the, the first year, they were both in fourth grade reading. They went from non-readers to fourth grade in one year. Uh, and, and that was because those groups were flexible and people were looking at data and performance. And that's the type of differentiation that can happen. But one other thing I'll say, I hope I'm not going on too long about that, is that you can't teach to mastery without differentiating instruction. So every time there's, there's an item and choral response, some students will get it correct, others won't. Well, the teacher immediately has to do an error correction for whatever pieces those students miss. And so that's the type of differentiating instruction that's required and very effective in DI. Mm, you have to be very tuned. Yeah, I mean, it's it's what we might call responsive teaching because you'd have to apply remedy on the spot um, when you notice a kid might not get the item right. And I was reading as well that to hit mastery, you only hit it like what if you're teaching the closest to the level where the students are at. Otherwise, if you're teaching too far off, you know, teaching at, at a level that well above the kids, you're unlikely to reach mastery in any case, because like what you were saying, they're not, or kids don't have yet the prerequisite skills to help them tackle new pieces. Yeah. Right. Um, and if you're teaching them below their current skill level, then you're not serving them adequately. They're just doing things that- No, and they're probably bored <laughs> or end up, yeah, yeah. Right. And one of the things that we do when we work with schools is we look at the results of the in-program data. And if if there's a student who aces their mastery tests or is acing their, their checkout several lessons in a row or several tests in a row, then we try to test up to see if they can move up to a more- Yeah, so you talk about the flexible, yeah. So yeah. you can move them up in that case, yeah. And you probably looked at or observed their behavior in the class too and see whether- you know, they start fidget, maybe they're too bored or it's, you know, they can be accelerated, which is also part of the beauty of DI is that you can teach more in less time and accelerate the learning of those kids. Yeah. Um, about implementation and evaluation. Let's say I'm a principal of a primary school. Um, I've got students who are struggling with spelling or reading, whichever in that case, but, and I'm just considering about getting into DI. Um, possibly implementing corrective reading or spelling mastery, um, but I'm new to DI. So I'd love to know what would be your advice? Where should I start? Um, you know, I'm brand new to DI and I wanna help those students. Where do I start? If you don't mind, I have a, a kind of a graphic, a flow chart I could share sure. that shows this. And this is uh, something I just, posted an article in, uh, in LinkedIn on this very topic. But mm -hmm. this is what we call the start of the year flow chart. Yeah. Uh, really, and some of these steps optimally should take place uh, at, the, at the end of the previous school year. Yeah. A definite flow to the sequence of steps that school leaders should take when they are 
starting to implement DI. And so this needs to be taken into consideration in planning. So the first thing to do is to placement test the students that are candidates for receiving DI. And if it's school-wide, then you test all of the students. And the reasons are just as, as you said, just we've been talking is that students to, to uh, for this, this approach to be effective, they need to be in lessons that match their skill level. And so all of the DI programs contain, um, contain placement tests. You can find them on the NIFTY website under the programs tab. Um, McGraw-Hill, I believe has those also, but you can go to the to www.nifty.org. Mm -hmm. And within uh, each level, there may be more than one entry point. So, uh, so it's important to keep testing students. And we work with, with schools, we have a, a half day placement test training, depending on how many programs um, that, that walks, walks the school leaders or the testing team through that process. Uh, mm -hmm. Because students are not placed at their year or their grade level, but they're placed at their performance level. Uh, and then instructional grouping can take place because we want these groups to be as homogeneous as possible. And there can be some art in this. It's, it's not necessary that all of the students will fit within the grouping guidelines. There are, there are grouping guidelines where it's generally, it's smaller group instruction for the lower levels of the program and gradually it gets larger by the grade two program of reading mastery, for instance, it's whole class, 25 mm -hmm. or students still homogeneous. Um, so at that point, when you've done that, you can look to see when you placement test the students and group them, you can see what your staffing resources are and, and to see the size of the implementations um, implications because there are student materials as well as teacher materials. And that's mm -hmm. the next part is to purchase the materials. Because uh, as I said, you don't just base it on their year. And then and only then do you, the teachers get trained because they need to be trained in the specific program that they're teaching. This is true mm -hmm. of course, for remedial programs like corrective reading, decoding, where you have four different levels. And so, level A is completely different than level C, for instance. So these are some of the steps that are important. And, and there are other pre-implementation steps that, that uh, can take place. Um, the teacher's guides are a very good resource. Mm -hmm. We have them yeah. too on our website. And there's an online tutorial you can take. It takes, it's in two parts. It takes about three hours total uh, the first part has to do with what should take place the year before implementation. Mm -hmm. Then next part uh, focuses on what you do after, after implementing. Scheduling and making sure there's sufficient time to schedule is important. Uh, it's great if you can have blocks of time to have cross-class or cross-grade grouping, depending on the size of the implementation. Yeah. And there are other things that take place, such as practice sessions and scheduling the initial training. Um, yeah. And so I would, after getting going through some of these basic pieces, I would also seek out expert help. You can email us at info at nifty.org, for instance, and we can give you some advice and support. Yeah, and the website is very useful too, uh, the Nifty website. And then you guys also organize um, a conference yearly. I was very lucky to be awarded a grant to attend two years ago. And I took, you know, that was very insightful for me. Um, so that's something else that others um, might be interested to look at. Right, right. We have open registration events. Coaching mm. academies are coming up, for instance. We're going to be doing other web-based things. And then we work intensively with school and district partners too. Great, awesome. Um, so from visiting schools, for instance, um, given that you've got a, a broad range of expertise, you know, um, going into school with that, you know, supporting them with the implementation, 
Uh, what are some of the support mechanisms that you've seen that are, you know, like non-negotiable or the one that you observe really are key to, to the success of the implementation of DI programs in schools? Yes, in order for for the programs to succeed, it's important to go through all those steps that we discussed mm -hmm. to make sure that there are, are schedules um, and, and that there are practice sessions um, among other things. So it's really important that the teachers know they're not alone for a large scale implementation of DI. And I actually have uh, another graphic, if I can find it quickly, that I would like to share that talks about what we call administrator functions, but but okay. uh, I think in the in the Australian context, it's school leader functions. And, yeah. And this is uh, oh, so where it says administrator functions, it oh, yeah. school leaders and. This actually parallels in the structure of a good part of my book, section two of the book, which mm -hmm. talks about setting expectations, monitoring instruction and responding actively that the, either the school principal or designee, such as an assistant principal of instruction, a teacher on special assignment, a literacy yeah. coach, something of that nature uh, should carry out functions connected with this. And so the there are a variety of different expectations uh, in terms of what the teachers are supposed to do for their delivery, making sure that they follow the script, that they administer the in-program assessments, um, that they correct all errors as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Then the school leaders monitor, monitor really from the beginning. So for the pre-service training, that's what we call the program training that we provide immediately. It's important to make sure that the teachers have uh, the skills to get started in delivering direct instruction. Two thirds of the time spent in those training sessions have to do with practice, practicing the scripts. Mm -hmm. And there are role plays that take place first with the the session instructor and all the participants, but then in small groups where one teacher will play the role of the teacher, one participant will be the teacher and, and the others in that small group will be, uh, will play the role of students and make designated errors. So they get practice in delivering the uh, particular types of the script because the teachers really need to know the script fluently, including what type of signals to give, what type of choral responses, what type of errors to correct. And so, uh, so a lot of that has to take place either during the training or as I said, during supervised practice sessions. But then monitoring, monitoring either in person, sometimes video or sometimes with a report of an external support provider or, or, or a local coach is really important and monitoring through the data. So data is really helpful because you get a picture school-wide of what's going on. And it's important that teachers fill out the data accurately and, and, um, and submit it in time and then responding actively. Celebrations, uh, reinforcing what's going well is always the fun part. Trying to identify what are the problems either at the classroom level or the school-wide level. Those are all some of the most uh, important ways of responding. I really like that visual. It makes it very clear and you kind of hit the next questions I was going to ask. <laughs> um, yeah, like like monitoring. So you talk about possibly having a local coach, right? So you could either 
get an external provider to help you, you know, and especially in the early days, I guess, you know, it's really multitask to be able to use a script and then a signal in response to the errors. There's a lot going on, especially at the start. Mm -hmm. um, and then how, how, what are some of the strategy or whether there's any mechanism in place to help build capacity internally? So then the check-in or the monitoring is, is done on site rather than having to rely on an external provider. Yes, and I have yet another visual, which I have, oh, hold on. <laughs> the, I think this may be the last of, of the visuals to share with you, and it's it's also from my book. Uh, hold on one second, that's the old one. So this is called mm -hmm. the Implementation Priority Pyramid, and it is very helpful mm -hmm. in establishing priorities for, for monitoring. Now, the first okay. level of monitoring is just basic um, structural observations to make sure that teachers are, are, that instruction is taking place for the full amount of time, that all the materials are in place, that the data sheets are being submitted. Um, but in classrooms, the, the best type of monitoring or the, the most effective is to first take a look at student engagement. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if students are engaged, it doesn't matter what type of instruction you're doing, if they're not engaged, they will not be able to benefit from the instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a, a very good measure. And we have a separate form that we use for DI or other types of activities uh, called the two minute, it's called the principal um, form or the two minute observation form. And it just focuses on what's the activity and is everyone engaged? Engaged properly, not just not making trouble um, or creating a fuss, but are they actively engaged in, in that activity? And so yeah. that's really helpful when you have a school-wide implementation because you can do a sweep uh, a sweep and see. And this is a great way for a school leader who is, is very busy just to get into a few classrooms. You know, two minutes is not that difficult. There's also another five minute observation that looks at other structural elements, but mm -hmm. who can say no to getting in, going into at least three or four classrooms a day, just to mm -hmm. see are the students engaged at this time, this time, or that time. Um, and lack of student engagement, you don't know what the problem could be. It could be that the material is too difficult for the kids. It could be mm -hmm. that um, it, the material is too easy for the, for the students. It could be that the teacher is, is not going at a pace that's engaging enough for the students. There are lots of different things, but at least it's a really good first measure. Then secondly, are students placed properly in the program? Uh, and this is a bit more complex that I don't know if we can get to on this webinar. It has to do with first time correct. Are students getting most everything correct the first time? Because you may, and there's a specific number of percentage that, that we use for new versus uh, review material. Mm -hmm. um, because if they are not getting at least most of what is a review correct from previous times, from previous lessons, then it means they probably were not taught to mastery before and there may be some other problems that took place. Then effectiveness of instruction has to do with are all errors corrected? And there is a seven step error mm -hmm. correction process that includes delay tests to make sure to get that retrieval practice uh, of the students. So are all are, are all students 100% firm on everything by the end of the lesson? And then lastly, well, how much time is this taking place? How much time is spent on this lesson or even this particular exercise or activity? Um, because if time is not being used efficiently enough, then students aren't gonna be making their, their adequate progress. Mm. And so we have different different uh, monitoring tools that correspond to these different levels of priority. 
And I find some really good um, checklists, actually, that I've trialed myself. Like you talk about the two minutes or five minutes, but I find in your book, you've got really good um, checklists to help um, doing class observation when you go in and observe teachers. Um, one often, I guess, uh, challenges that could observe in classes is the use of signal, uh, when and what type and for what type of activity. And the second most common challenge I find teachers really struggle with is the error correction procedures, uh, which is a, a, a very tricky to master. Like we start with the first three steps and then tackle the seven steps. But it, it is a, do you have any tips for, to support teachers with that embedding error correction procedures? I find that's really difficult. Yes, when you're learning the program, all the programs will have a little box that says to correct, or many of the programs will. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be a format, really practice that thoroughly in the, in the practice sessions with others, practice making mistakes, that's really important. Yeah. But to get the full seven steps, we actually have in our store, the Nifty store, we have put together video in-services and okay. some of them are on air corrections. We have some other ones that are on the thermometer charts and another one on emphasizing keywords. But that those, those video in-services are really helpful because all you need is a facilitator who, who without DI expertise and you can run yeah. the staff. Yeah. And, and you do have this information in, um, in a series guide as well. Which, which is to me like it's the Bible, like everything is in there if you have any question, but obviously sometimes you just don't read in full from, you know, front to cover, but I also encourage teachers to keep going back and forth uh, into the series, guys, because it's, it's, it's gold. There's so many information and most answers are in there to me, like all the questions teachers ask. Um, I'm just going to go back to the instructional grouping because that's another challenge that schools are facing. Um, I'm talking, I guess, from my point of view in a system level, we've implemented spending mastery, um, but we haven't implemented it at year level. So it's from three to six because we've got all the programs in place in the early years. And so just some schools find it really tricky to do that instructional grouping because they've got logistical constraint, either staffing, resources, space, sometimes, time. Um, do you have any um, good tips um, or best advice in that space? Yes, sometimes instructional grouping really can be a, a challenge. Um, my advice to teachers or to school leaders in general is early on to train everybody train as many people yeah. as possible um, because then that gives you a wider range of, of folks to to draw on for an implementation including substitute yeah. teachers well we've had substitute teachers go through the full training and then when they come on site they receive coaching etc um, I mentioned how in Atlanta we worked with several middle schools there and our model, our middle school model for those schools where all students were behind is to train the whole staff. So music teachers, yeah. librarians, counselors, everybody got, got trained, physical education teachers. So, so that, that may not solve your problem, but it, at least it increases the resources that you have. And then uh, trying to come with up with alternative schedules, depending on what's going on, if, if there That's is cool. an intervention period or if there's some other planning time, free time that can be used even a couple times a week, that, that, can, that can help. Uh, I've seen that done. Um, if you've done all those type of structural changes though, then you'll just need to prioritize. Yeah. Mm. Over the last several years, we've worked with some schools, secondary schools in England that were implementing corrective mathematics. Mm -hmm. When they did the placement test, uh, the placement testing, it was thought beforehand that the students were going to place up to the uh, fractions module of corrective mathematics. 
but overwhelmingly the students placed in the addition and subtraction modules. So okay. immediately that implementation had to change. The, the students who placed in addition were given the highest priority and then just trying to help those, those kids out. The, the last thing I would say is if you are implementing at the secondary level, one thing you can try to do, unless you have a lot of feeder schools that are sending kids to your school, if you just have one or two, is to mm -hmm. see if you can get DI going in those, the, those schools. The earlier, the better. Um, mm -hmm. Middle school principal that we worked with in Atlanta, he bought materials out of his own budget and got corrective reading going in the upper elementary levels. So he didn't have kids coming in who were so far behind in reading. It's tricky. Yeah, I hear you because I use DI in high school myself. Um, so for high school kids at risk. Um, and in Australia, you have so kindergarten, first year, you know, compulsory schooling, and then it goes up to year six. And then after that, it's high school. So there's no middle school the same way in the US. And so you've got lots of kids going into high school in year seven and, and a growing number, sadly, you know, it's unfortunate to say, but a growing number of kids who can't read um, and struggle with that transition as well. And, and a lot of those teachers might not be equipped to deal with low literacy um, in their subject. Um, so I've, I've seen a couple of high schools using corrective reading. Um, I mean, not just a few. Is there, yeah, is that something that, yeah, you would recommend or, or you've worked with high school using DI programs and it worked well to catch up those kids at your level? It's worked where the school leaders we've, we've been involved with have been creative about the credits because one yeah. of the things that we've discovered is that students, when they're approaching graduation, if it's not for credit, they won't take it. And and so we've had corrective reading actually count, I don't think it legally should have, but count towards uh, their English language requirements. So oh, is that what you mean by credit? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that will be legally right, but I guess maybe having some um, ways to maybe lower some of the um, weighting in, in the assessment, maybe if those kids attend corrective reading, for instance, in the English classes, then maybe reduces a bit of the amount of, of assessment for those kids. That could be one way to do it. And to draw back on what you were saying about priorities, to me, it's down to leadership priority, um, you know, whether they put, you know, high literacy as a high priority or reading or math. Um, making sure the gaps are filled for those kids at risk, and especially in high school, because that's the last last chance, really, before they graduate. There have been some projects I've been involved in at the community college level to use uh, yeah. direct instruction programs there, um, as, as well as in prisons, which is really terrible because you have kids who who get into trouble and they may not have if they had good literacy skills, but they finally do. Yeah, get. yeah, there is a correlation. Yeah, and what about what about parents? Let's say I'm a parent and my kids is struggling with reading, for instance. Would you recommend using some of the DI um, for parents? Well, I, I should say you know there's another book. I do have a copy of it over there uh, called "Teach Your Child to Read in 100 Easy Lessons," where parents can use that program. There's another one. Uh, called Funix, F-U-N-N-I-X, that has used a different approach, funix.com. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a software-based program. Uh, both of those can be highly successful for students or for, for children. Um, and, and so, yeah, I was, I was involved a little bit in helping support the recent revision of Teach Your Child to Read, which has sold over a million copies worldwide. Oh, wow. Teach Your Child to Read is a fast version of a fast cycle of reading mastery. So it's the same program, just going at a, at a quicker pace. That's the pace. Yeah, great. Well, um, I just want to thank you because I, I think, um, you know, I mean, you've been very generous with your, with your time. It's nearly an hour and, and I told you 45 minutes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just want to thank you very much for your time and your expertise and, and sharing your work. Like, um, I'm a big fan of the eye and, and I'm very, 
I feel honoured to get to speak to you one to one today um, and um, all the way from the US. So, so thank you so much. Is there anything you want to add? I, I just hope that everyone can be successful with the students that you have. You teach them to mastery in whatever way that you do you'll be preparing them for, for more advanced work. But a great, great to talk with you, Jessica. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Kurt, and see you next time.